And now, an eighth special presentation. In this edition of Artbeat Nation, we see the inner workings of an immense instrument. Pipe organs are a rarity, and they're part of our musical heritage that, in my opinion, should be preserved. Meet an artist with an eye for the overlooked. I'm drawn to things that were disparate parts reassembled, and it all becomes a metaphor. Encounter a printmaker who embraces his playful side. The penguin inspired me to be a better father, so now the giraffe is inspiring me to be a better artist and learn about the secret lives of the members of a new indie band. But we ended up with something that I think has a uniform feeling and texture. It's all ahead on this edition of Artbeat Nation. Funding for Artbeat Nation was made possible by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you. In this next segment, see what's hidden inside Sacramento's Memorial Auditorium. Reporter Rob Stewart takes us both backstage and underground to bring history to life. Let's go explore one of the area's most recognized buildings, the Sacramento Memorial Auditorium, where inside we found a historic organ that some people call a sleeping giant. And we're here with the man who woke up the sleeping giant, this beautiful pipe organ inside of Memorial Auditorium. Scott Nelson, good to see you. Thank you, Rob, for coming. Yes, you are the curator here. And this is an amazing piece of history dating back to 1926. It is indeed. Tell me about it. Well, uh, most auditoriums in that era were required to have uh, pipe organs so that they could accompany films or um, just any event that was required at that point because an organist was always less expensive than an orchestra. And this auditorium was built in memory of soldiers who died in World War I. That's correct. And there are not many organs from that era in auditoriums still around. You That's said correct. there's less than a dozen? There's probably about seven in their original condition Wow, that are still left. You know, I've been in here a ton of times and I had no idea that there was an organ here. Well, that's why I call it the sleeping giant because you don't really know there's an organ here unless you look in the pit if it's visible or if the light's just right, you can see reflection of light uh, on some of the pipes inside. I see, so that's why we were rising up because this goes back down into the pit. Correct. It's called a cash register style console. It's historic. And in this day and age, pipe organs are a rarity. And they're part of our, I guess you could say, musical heritage that, in my opinion, should be preserved. It represents a part of our history. And as a mechanical instrument, it shows one of the most complex instruments ever built. Uh, that you don't get to see, but you certainly get to hear it. Well, speaking of, can you take us to see some of it? I'd be glad to. All right, follow let's, me. Let's get up in the rafters. Come on, let's go explore. This is the relay room, or the brains of the organ. The brains of the organ. So this is all of the mechanical wiring and functioning. God, this is old. Right, this is original from 1926. The cables come from the console upstairs down through a, a trough, wooden trough that was built to protect it and comes down in here and terminates. This is all hardwired and soldered. Everything had to be wrung out by hand. Uh, in the old days, they didn't have the luxury of modern technology. It's amazing to me that it still works. It's amazing to me that it still works. <laughs> and Scott, what's behind this door? Oh my gosh, look at all these pipes. We're presently in the swell chamber, which is the third keyboard on the organ console. It's uh, one of the most uh, utilized 
divisions of the pipe organ. It has very loud stops and some of the softest stops in the organ. Is it rare to get to come in here? Uh, it is indeed. Uh, we keep a padlock on the door so that not just anybody can walk in. How many pipes? I mean, it must be thousands. In the total organ, there are over 3,500 pipes. You're in, kidding. In this room, there are probably over 900 pipes. Man, we are squeezed in here. You say this is the, the choir division? The choir division. This has some of the softest stops in the organ in it, as well as uh, a duplex division, which is playable on another keyboard, which has some of the string stops of the organ on it. And everywhere I look, I see both metal and wooden pipes. Correct. Well, I love exploring and finding history and, in this case, art alive. Scott, thank you so much for showing us this beautiful pipe organ. My pleasure, and I hope that uh, you'll be able to come back for a live performance. I'd love to take you up on it here at Memorial Auditorium in Sacramento. To learn more, visit sacramentoconventioncenter.com. Lynn Parks is a Baltimore-based photographer and visual artist who gravitates towards stark urbanscapes finding beauty in random design and juxtapositions. Ravaged by a rare disease, she says she is often drawn to the discarded. I'm Lynn Parks and I'm an artist. I don't think I ever decided that I wanted to be an artist. Being an artist is something you just are. It's just a matter of consciousness. In terms of making art, the process is everything. The process is consciousness. It's a matter of what I'm dealing with in my life. And the thing that helps me most, more than anything really, is walking. And I just happen to walk with a camera. The things I'm drawn to tend to be decayed, attached together. They become a metaphor for my own personal experience with um, a rare disease that I've had since I was a child. I have rare tumors, and these tumors are very aggressive. They destroy local structures, and I have a number of skin grafts, so I feel like I'm a bit of a patchwork girl, and so I'm drawn to things that were disparate parts reassembled, and it all becomes a metaphor for me. I can't dismiss beauty, <laughs> and I suppose I find beauty in unlikely places. So I'm drawn into alleys. I love alleys. What I find there are that old windows patched together with bits of board, plastic, glass, it, it all becomes an assemblage that's accidental. When I see this, I connect to it in terms of my own experience. Doing this is all about joy because it's just ecstatic when you're so in love <laughs> with form and texture and color. It's just when you're in the midst of it, it's an ecstasy. In terms of myself, some people would consider me to be disabled or disfigured and those words don't really cut it for me. I'm, I'm different. Um, and it's a matter of, I think for me, seeing other things that are different and hopefully finding the things within or what they show that give beauty. And so I hope we can all come to a new understanding of what can be beautiful.
To learn more, visit musingrelics.com. The prints of Albuquerque, New Mexico artist Ray Maisman have hatched from dreams, myths, children's stories, and chance observations. With a strong imagination and a cast of animal characters, Maisman has created worlds that transport the viewer and leave them wanting more. Here's a look. lends itself to metaphor. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, all the stuff I make, it's kind of like after I've made it, like, oh, this is what this meant. At the time, it's just kind of a, I should put this bicycle here. I should put this animal on this bicycle. There should be a thing off the top of the bicycle. Oh, this wants a little mountain in the background. So it's not, it's like not thinking about what it all means. It's just mm. like composition and what color looks good. And somehow through that, whatever was floating around the back of my brain pops out. You know, when my kids were younger, that was a lot of sort of fatherhood stuff and parenting things and a lot of traveling happens. And I, you know, I don't know how much that's wanting to travel. Some of it's wanting to literally travel. Some of it's sort of like, you know, life is a journey kind of thing. And I guess the idea of archetypes, I mean, that's the Jungian philosophy thing of these ideas that are in all our heads. And I figured that must be a good word because even though in my head, it was all about stuff in my head, it seems to resonate with their head too. And that's what archetypes are supposed to do. It's supposed to be universal. And the metaphor part of that is, you know, metaphors, they're kind of ambiguous. You know, sometimes maybe the boat is a boat, but you can interpret it lots of ways. Your work is, to me, it's, it's, it's excitingly curious. You're trying to figure out the dynamics between, say, a penguin and a giraffe. So let's talk a little bit about the characters in your work. The, the animals started happening because a friend gave me a book about animal fathers, and the first third of the book was about emperor penguins. And I didn't know anything about male penguins, but reading the book, I discovered the male emperor penguins, they take care of the egg. Now, well, that's a good role model for being, I'm going to try to be that dedicated. Um, and after a while, the penguin needed a buddy, like the penguin sure. was solo and the penguin needed a friend. And so seahorses, the males get pregnant. The males mm. bear the young. And so the seahorse started showing up. At that point, evolved from this fatherhood thing to just, are they two friends? Is it a relationship? Are they a couple? Are they parenting the egg? Is the egg something else? Like the whole metaphor thing kind of took off. Questions. And um, it also kind of evolved into this arch archetypal thing of the anima and the animus where like, if you're a man, you have your internal woman, and if you're a woman, you have your internal sure. man, and it kind of became that. I'm still like, depending on you, the viewer, as to whether the penguin's the internal woman or the seahorse is or what, but just that playing with like female male identity and like and, what well, that means. And the giraffe and the bird? So, well, the penguin seahorse got to the point where like people were giving me penguin and seahorse gifts, and I was just, uh, <laughs> I don't want to stop. I don't want to be the penguin guy. I don't want to be the seahorse guy. I need a new animal. Um, and around that time, I was reading a book about the giraffes in the Prague Zoo in what was then Czechoslovakia. It was this whole epic story of how the giraffes got from Africa to the zoo and it had all this stuff about giraffe biology and giraffe psychology and just sort of how giraffes work. And one of the things that really struck me was their eyeball is proportionally the biggest eyeball of any animal. There was a sense that for giraffes, their vision is kind of the way you smell is for dogs. Like they're, you know, dogs smell things we don't smell. and a giraffe maybe sees things we don't see or sees a level of detail that we don't see as humans. And I thought, well, that's a good, that's a good artist metaphor. I'm going to try nice. to, mm. the penguin inspired me to be a better father. So now the giraffe is inspiring me to be a better artist. So when you have the two giraffes staring at each other and there, one has the caged bird, one has the not caged bird, there's certainly a narrative. It, yeah. And maybe that's where the question is. There is a narrative. There's definitely, I mean, sometimes I have a fuzzy idea of the narrative when I start, or maybe I even have a clear idea. Sometimes I don't know until it's over, but there's a narrative. There's a, and I want people to be able to look at it and make up a story or have a sense of story, but without it being tied to this is the one story. So do people ever ask you what the bird is? Birds are like this stereotypical 
the iconography is birds are supposed to be souls or spirits and mm -hmm. that's kind of what they've ended up being most of the time. So like in the two giraffe ones, the bird, they each have a bird and the bird's like their little spirit or their little soul or whatever and one of them has her bird in a cage and the other one has his bird free but he's in a cage and you, whatever you may think you're doing at a given time, your bird's off there maybe doing what you're really doing or maybe actually seeing what wow. you're really doing because mm -hmm. it's up flying up high, it has the bird's eye view. That kind of sense of play, that inherent sense of play that children have and that you have in your work, can you tell us where that playfulness in your work comes from? It's really important to feel like you are safe and comfortable enough to just try things without knowing how it's going to turn out, without knowing for sure what it's going to mean. I think part of why I like setting up the picture so people have to ask questions is it sort of forces them to get out of their little, their little rut, whatever their little rut might be. In your personal experience, your personal background, how, is, how does playfulness connect to kind of your, your upbringing? Neither one of my parents was super playful, but my dad definitely was not. And as he went through life, you know, and there's lots of addiction stuff there and alcohol and cigarettes and whatnot, especially as I got older, I could look at him and be like, you know, you're just, you're stuck. I mean, definitely when addiction stuff happens, like, you know, they've done, people have done studies where like people's brains get kind of almost literally rutted, like you get in this path of whatever your addiction is. And I could, I'd read about those and look at my father and be like, well, yeah, that's, he can't, it's too scary to get out of the rut. And he, there's not any play happening. I have two brothers, I think for all three of us, we sort of looked at our father and went, we're not going to be like that. I'm going to be a better dad, I'm going to be a more happier person. And I think for me, the art was just a way to explore that. Let's extend this playful trajectory. Mm -hmm. What is the, the future, you know, the kind of progression of your arts? I don't know. I think a big change just happened, I haven't digested it yet. Um, this summer I'd spent a month living in the Faroe Islands, which are up in the Norwegian Sea. It was this artist residency, so I spent a month in this whole other country, far away from here. It removed me from my normal context. It was an adventure, and since I got back I've had almost no interest in giraffes. The penguins <laughs> is still floating around, mm -hmm. but I think it's a return to, I think earlier the penguin was more like partly a self-portrait sort of like stand-in for me and that the penguin has reappeared that way. But I don't know yet what that means. It makes me think about stuff, but I'm not conscious that I'm thinking. I'm just making stuff and then mm -hmm. down the road, I'll know what it means. Down and I'm not there yet. I'm the penguin in the boat sailing across the water. The metaphor. Or floating through the air, the metaphor of like, I'm going, I'm, I'm going somewhere. Something about being a human, you want to go see what's there. You want to go find out what else is there besides what's right in front of me? To learn more, visit raymazeman.com. Dave Buker and the Historians is a Columbus, Ohio-based indie band. Here's an inside scoop into the origin of the band's name and a front row seat to their first music video. My name is Dave, uh, I'm a science educator, and I, I sing and play guitar in the band. I'm Joe, I'm a preschool teacher, and I play drums. My name is Brooklyn, and I play keys and sing. My name is Leanna, and I sing harmonies, and I am a science educator. My name is Paul, I work at Sam Ash Music, and I play keys and sing in the band. My name is Mark, uh, I work for a textbook company, and I play bass guitar. The name is because it's sort of our philosophy that songwriting is the act of documenting your own emotions and experiences that, and, and of those that you know that may have otherwise gone undocumented. So you're kind of there taking snapshots and, and those in files so everybody can kind of remember those things. I think in terms of producing an album, that's down to an individual basis. If you want to make a certain kind of music and you want to record it and you want it to be good, it's all dependent on how hard you work. Yeah. Just last week I said it kind of felt like a musical soundtrack where it had a theme that it started with and came back to and kind of finished with. 
Yeah, it definitely does. And that theme is, is the title, the line, What Can Bring You Back To Me. Um, that shows up in three different songs. Bring you here with sweeter tears that can bring you back to me. We worked really hard on this record to kind of find a sound. And not in a kind of a, we need to write songs that are going to fit this mold, because that feeling would be a little bit boring. But we ended up with something that I think has a uniform feeling and texture uh, that makes it feel like an album. About a month ago, we filmed a music video. We filmed it at uh, Cafe Kerouac Coffee Shop, which is down on uh, High Street near OSU's campus. It's been very good to us over the years as well. Yeah, we've played there a lot. Mike, who owns, owns it, is, is incredibly good to us. Y you will notice in the video that Paul is not facing the band, and we wanted Paul to be facing the band, but when we tried to move the piano, the leg fell off. <laughs> so, If you go there and find that the piano has fallen over. Don't tell him. I think it was already <laughs> broken, but Mike might not be happy with us. Winter blew a chill through my window to my bone, so I followed your footsteps in the snow. Oh, and they led me to your door, let me feel some warmth, and I remembered what my thawing heart is for. Spring came, you stood just like Eve with an apple, and so we built our paradise and tower of Babel. And as we climbed up to the top, we knew even if we dropped, it hardly mattered, not even God could make us stop. There must be something about the weather as it's changing, all these molecules of air trying to keep us separated. I know change is what we need Desperately I'm just sorry that I ever had to leave The heat of the summer melted us together And so we joked about our plans And the opinion of my brother But as I wandered through our palms Thinking of it all, I have to wonder if jokes will lead us to our fall. Must be something about the weather as it's changing. All these molecules of air trying to keep us separated. I know change is what we need desperately. I'm just sorry that I ever had to leave. Could ever be the same. Must be something about the weather as it's changing. All these molecules of air trying to keep us separated. I know change is what we need desperately. I'm just sorry that I ever had. To learn more, visit DaveBuker.com. For more arts and culture, visit azpbs.org artbeat, where you'll find feature videos and information on the Arizona art scene. Funding for Artbeat Nation was made possible by contributions to aid from viewers like you. Thank you. <laughs>